even inside I was smashed and crying and in little pieces. You are a person and you matter. And you have to stop giving everything that you have to somebody else over and over again. You are where it starts. There is life, yes, it's difficult to leave. There was a lot of shame for me. Again, another failed relationship. Why did this happen? Why, you know, like, why did you do this to me? I make this choice for me. And I'm choosing me over anything else. Welcome to The She Word, conversations that women rarely have but really should. And we are well into season four of The She Word. Now, if you're joining us for the first time or if you're a regular here on The She Word but haven't yet subscribed, under here, somewhere on YouTube, you're going to find that subscribe button. Just hit that right now. And if you're listening to us on Spotify, head on to the app, make sure you subscribe there. Why? Because we have amazing content coming up for you, not just in this season, but throughout 2024. Also, if you haven't yet followed or liked us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok, head there and do that right now because we have a lot more content coming there too. And we have a lot of stuff happening in this year. And one of those things is the She Word Live coming to the MCC on the 24th and 25th of May. First of all, put those dates in your diary, the 24th and 25th of May, and then head through our socials to find the link to go and get yourself a ticket or a ticket for both days. The 24th is going to be empowering women in the workplace and the 25th is empowering women in the world. And we have the best international speakers from around the globe coming for this event, as well as incredible people here joining us from the Maltese Islands. We're going to have keynote speeches, panel discussions, Q&A, and so, so much more. Head to the socials, make sure you sign up, get involved with that. Now, if you're joining us on the Patreon page, a massive thank you and welcome to you because you're seeing this before anybody else. But not only are you seeing it before anybody else, you are also doing something amazing because 50% of the profits of the Patreon page goes directly to our partners at the Richmond Foundation to support women who are affected by any of the topics we ever talk about, who want to get support or guidance and simply can't afford it. So thank you to you. Now, here on The She Word, we discuss topics that are not just fun and entertaining, but we also discuss topics that are harder to have conversations about, but are also very important. It's taken a while to get to this topic that we're discussing in this episode, but I am thrilled to have three incredible women here to discuss separation and divorce. It's not only a topic that d- directly affects 40% of women in Europe, but also in the 12 years since divorce was legalized in Malta, the islands have seen a total of approximately 4,500 couples divorcing. And according to Love in Malta, that tallies up to about an average of one a day. So joining us for this conversation, Francesca Fenaconti, the founder of Women for Women and a women's empowerment icon here in Malta. Fran has already joined us on the She Word in season three. We were talking about sex. Yes. You remember? (laughs) Yes, I remember. And when I asked you which of the topics that were on the agenda for season four you'd like to join us on, you said you'd like to join us for separation and divorce. And I'm going to ask you in a second why that topic stuck out to you. Sarah Bayada. Hello. (laughs) Hello. It's so good to have you here. You are a TV presenter, a book author. You're also a mum and a healthy lifestyle enthusiast, as well as committed to empowering other women who are facing challenges. Your separation journey started in the middle of covid 
when you are battling postnatal depression and you've been incredibly open about that. And I thank you for that. So I'm so thrilled that you are here joining us to inspire other women today. Now we're going to come back to you in a second and find out more about your journey. But Monica Schembri, hello. Hi. Hello. I'm so excited <laughs> to have you here because you're also a hero and an inspirational woman, you're a breast cancer survivor. Yes, I am. And you've spoken so openly about this. And it was an absolute pleasure and, and a real eye-opener to research you uh, before you came on the show today. You're also a proud mum of three. And you have, from your socials, from all of your communications, I found a real passion for staying positive, yes. even in the face of <laughs> adversity. So I'm going to talk to you in a second, but one of the things I really liked about researching you online is that you keep talking about the fact that there is life after separation. And so I'm so thrilled and thank you for being here. Now I'm going to stick with you because I've probably missed a few things out. Okay. Fill, fill in the gaps for me. Fill in a little bit about you and about your journey. All right. Well, as you said, I am a breast cancer survivor. Um, I had um, negative triple cancer. So that's another area of it. So um that was tough, I think so, um, tough life journey, but um, I was really open, as I said, uh, going through that. So then when um, life happened and um, separation started to happen, obviously I said, you know, there is nothing to be ashamed of. And I'm talking proudly again about it. I think so it's very important because we don't hear much about divorce and separation or we feel ashamed to yeah. say it that we are um i am mom of three of minor kids so i think so um showing them positivity in this negative situation uh, empowers me and gives me motivation and goals to keep going every day I already love this woman. Mm -hmm. You're amazing. You're amazing. And I'm really looking forward to you being part of this conversation. Sarah, isn't this amazing? It isn't is it? It's so wonderful to hear such a lovely lady to speak about the, the best part of it all is that she feels so empowered. And even by listening to her, she actually empowers me. Now, I am doing kind of like the same thing because my whole idea throughout all this journey was I never had someone to look up to like Monica, that I can actually relate to and say, yes, she's been through the same struggles. Because usually like back at the time when I was getting separated in the beginning, it was like I was carrying shame about my separation. Mm -hmm. It's like I wanted to not show that I'm going through separation, especially for the fact that I was on media. So finally, the first everyone's like covering my wedding and now all of a sudden what, <gasps> what happened to about it? It was in such a short span. And in my case, it was exactly when my son was born. So no one could understand what's really going on because obviously I had just given birth to this baby. So it's, you said it before, it's like you're grieving this future that you had in your mind, mm. but no one can actually understand totally what you're going through, especially in my case, because I was battling postnatal depression and going through all this rough patch all at once where being a mother for the first time is already it's like already hard a change enough. in identity Gosh. let alone having to deal with separation and when then it comes to infidelity that is a whole different mm. ball game wow well we're going to go into that we're going to talk about the grief we're going to talk about the reality i need just something that you highlighted there that that both of you, you're both mums. And I just, it, I've gone through the whole of this she word. Suddenly I'm not a mum. And that whole journey has been eye, eye opening for me, just understanding mums. But to go through this at the same time, ample respect to you. And I'm looking forward to diving <laughs> right nice and deep into this topic. Fran, I mean, I don't feel like I need to say any more about you because everybody knows you, but why, 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 when I said to you that there was a, we have another show on sex in this season, you didn't choose that one. <laughs> you wanted to talk about separation and divorce. Why did this show in particular stand out to you? Okay, so I'm separated and divorced and remarried, so that's already a part of me that I can't escape. It's part of my history of who I am. But also because I feel that a lot of women... 
uh, stay in bad relationships. So I'm taking another look at this. Um, stay in bad relationship because of shame of mm. um, separating and uh, divorce and going through the separation. So when you spoke to me and mentioned it, um, I didn't know which angle you were going to take, but this is what came to mind. Um, because the conversations happen a lot on Women for Women. There are a lot of women who are being cheated on, they know, and they, they come on the, on, the, on the group and they ask anonymous questions about infidelity and what should they do, or their husband is totally un -pres not present in their life. Mm -hmm. not, um, so it's a very important subject that we need to discuss from both grieving and recovery yeah. and also from not staying in bad relationships yeah. you know um although obviously you try and fix it because i've been you you know someone told me last time on the group you're always saying you know telling people to leave but you know at the end of the day your happiness and even the children you, if you stay in bad relationships even the children suffer absolutely. especially if there's domestic violence if there's absolutely. you know so absolutely so that's why it's important. To I'm me. so glad that you you did say that you would come on this particular show, and I'm so glad because you and I are sort of slight veterans in this yes. particular topic. I was married at 24, divorced by 28, and I sort of dealt with all of the 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 shame and the the legacy that went with that. And and you yourself, we we yes. both remarried, Many years ago, and we exactly. know that there's life after separation Fantastic. and divorce. And I yes. think that's also part of the conversation that we're going to have to do is. I mean, surrounded by incredibly positive, beautiful, amazing women. And I think it's going to be a really good discussion to empower other women as well. And, and also to give that idea that you go through a process, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. Now, we mentioned, you mentioned, Monica, that this is, this is actually a topic that I can't believe has taken four seasons to get to talk about, bearing in mind how many people are affected by this. Because as I said before, it's, it's not just the people that are involved in the divorce, it's everybody around them. Yes. It's the families. And we'll talk about that as well. But just to drop some statistics, if you are joining us and this is a topic that affects you, what, please know you are not alone because some 1.7 million marriages and an estimated 0.7 million divorces took place in the EU in 2021. This is where we had the statistics from, the most recent statistics. So that's, that's nearly 1 million divorces took place in the EU in 2021. Almost 50% of all marriages, 50% of all marriages end in divorce or separation in the United States. Five years separation with or without consent is the reason behind 13% of Britain's divorce. Only 1% of UK marriages end because of desertion. And the divorce rate in the United Kingdom is 42%. That's nearly half of the people that get into a relationship, a marriage, end up in divorce or separation. Individuals may go through several stages of mourning or grief. The emotional, emotional intensity of this period usually peaks within the first six months of separation. However, the grieving process may take as long as two years. And I would say that's probably a huge underestimate because I think that we are affected by what we go through for an awful lot longer than that. But the grieving process would last up to two years. So I'm really glad that we're here. We're having this conversation, as I said, and I want to kick off with one question. We often talk about separation and divorce in terms of statistics, logistics, childcare, and we're going to talk about childcare as well. But many more of the black and white aspects of divorce. But separation and divorce is just downright painful for everybody who's involved, for family, for the children of the married couple, and quite often friends are affected by it as well because they're, they're sometimes forced to take sides. Amicable divorces are very rare. And so usually there's also trauma involved and grief. We've mentioned grief. We've been on this show for about five minutes and we keep <laughs> mentioning grief. But it's really important to address that because we're gr grieving for profound loss. As you said, it's, it's grieving for something you hoped for and it's not happening. So I want to ask you, and I'll start with you, Sarah, there. What, 
was or is the elements of your separation that were most painful or traumatic? Is it this grief? You mentioned it yourself. So the grief part for me wasn't just grieving my marriage only. It was grieving a part of me as well. A part of me that I always wanted to be a wife. A part of me that I always wanted to be a present mom. And grieving as well this person that will be still living, but you no longer have any relation to him. Mm. So now all of a sudden you just... You're going to remove that emotional connection from this person and you're going to see him from a different lens. Mm. And that took a while for me to understand and grasp because I'm like, how can I just shift myself into this process where all of a sudden I'm just going to hand you over my child? And that was, I think, one of the, the, the toughest parts when Sam was still a newborn. So basically I'm like handing over my child, which was still not even walking to this person and saying, okay, you, you are going to be with my child, even though you kind of like abandoned the marriage. And till I actually got on, on this healing journey where I understood that and accepted that, listen, just because your marriage failed, it has nothing to do with your worth. Because most often times we associate our worth to us being married. At least I grew up into a very conventional family where everyone had to get married, sort of, because it was kind of family tradition, you know, like we were brought and raised like that. So even the fact that I was getting separated and I was going through this, I'm like, how am I going to approach this? You know, like... I didn't know how I'm going to actually speak about it in the beginning and I used to hide it. And being on media was even harder for me because you don't actually get to hear about TV personalities that speak about their divorce or their separation. You might hear in the pipeline that, you know, like that one got divorced, that one got separated, but no one actually speaks about mm. the process. Mm. No one actually speaks about the tough times. All you see on social media most of the times are happy families, you know, like everyone's united. Everyone has this picture perfect family. And I'm here with a newborn as a single mother when it wasn't the plan. <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is when you guys both spoke and I'll come to you in a second, Fran, because you and I both have distance, but you guys both spoke. One of the things that really hit me was, was Sarah, you've just had a newborn and you are going through literally I have discovered through the she word what that process is like postpartum postnatal depression your body's changed your hormones are everywhere and you're going through separation as well and Monica you've gone through breast cancer for crying out loud and a family and you're going through separation I mean I am profoundly of just blown away by your resilience I mean this this must have been incredibly hard yeah, in my case, um, as Sarah said, you know, you lose this griefing understanding. You go through stages of griefing and until you reach the stage of healing and understanding and trying to get your self-worth back, um, it takes time. Um, and in my case... Yes, I went through breast cancer. And as Sarah mentioned, everyone was seeing, you know, everyone was being supporting and being sad at the same time, you know, um, Monica is going through this. Um, and then being an amazing miracle, I got pregnant after breast cancer. And being in that stage where, yes, I'm getting back my life, you know, this is past, I went through it. Now the good time's coming, you know. Um, we're waiting for this uh, miracle baby to come. And boom, next month, I am single mother of three. Not even three, two at that time. So- Because you were pregnant. I was pregnant at that time. <sighs> so um, kind of, um, as you say, as everyone mentioned, you know, being this picture perfect, um, I mean, we weren't picture perfect, but then one day you see family all together and then next week everyone is looking at me alone as a single mother. So um, going through that and not having anyone, I think so, in a circle to relate to, give me the power, I think so, to talk about it. That's why, like, I mean, on social media, I'm not um, hiding anything. 
people probably got confused as well because, you know, uh, first of all, until I was okay, I didn't share anything because um, at the stages of griefing, probably all will agree to me, you are angry, you are frustrated. So sometimes, you know, at the beginning, I don't think so it's the right time, especially to share all of it, you know. But when I felt that I'm okay, um, I can let people know. In fact, some of my friends didn't know for the several months until I told them this is what happened, you know. Um, it gave me power to share and say, like, it's okay. I, I wish I had someone um, to look at, you know, and say, okay, she's going through the same path. Like, she's fine. I'll be fine. Um, so even reaching some, some, some a woman in the meantime reached to me and thanked me. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine, you know. We are all in this together. So, like, you support each other. So it kind of motivates you. Absolutely. I, I remember, and I'm going to come to you, Fran, because I, I think we were both at our separation and divorce were a ago. number of years ago. Mine over two, two decades ago. Mm. But I remember I was only 28 and I remember you guys have, it's profound to me that you are saying the same thing I experienced. Yes. I was at the point where all of my friends were just getting married. I'd got married before them and I was the divorcee. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted to be near me in case they caught it. And I felt so isolated. And if you are in a, in a phase, the hardest phase of your life, you're grieving for something that you hope for and you've lost it. You know, you said something, Sarah, and I don't know about you guys. I will come, Fran, but I just wanted to, to throw this in as well. I remember saying to, to, uh, to a friend of mine at the time, my godfather died at the same time, and my godmother was grieving for his death. And I, and I want to try and say this as sensitively as possible, but I kind of wished my husband had died. Because at least if he had died, I would have had sympathy. People would have been like, I'm so sorry. But instead, I had blame. What did you do to this up? What did you do to make this mess? What did you do wrong? And I'm like, actually, I didn't do anything. He was a monster. But were you in the same position? Because when, when did different. you get... When so did you... I, I separated when my son was nine months old. So as well, very, very recent. Um, a long time ago, but I had just given birth. Baby right. was a baby, nine months old. And I really, it was the saddest thing that ever happened to me, really, you know, um, because like we had the hopes and the dreams of the family and raising. And, and for me, um, I still remember I wrote a diary saying to my son, you know, all how I wished I could have given him a family. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> because, no, because it's true. Cry. Because, you know, you, you have these dreams and aspirations of a family and you want to be happy no matter yeah. how, how bad it is and you want to try. So, but it takes two. Yeah. You can't do it on your own. So anyway, um, so it was very sad for me. Um, I grieved for a few months. I, I wouldn't go out. Um, then one time I, I met a... So it's so good to have friends and people to speak. So um, I met a girlfriend I hadn't seen for a long time. And she was with two babies. She had a, like a one-year-old, the same age as my son. Christine, hi, Christine. I, lo I love her till... Because she really helped me. She made all the difference. So, and she had a baby as well. And she told me, she said, like, listen, I said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself still, you know, I'm separated I'm my, with my son. I'm like a single mom now. She said, what do you do? I said, I don't go out. You know, I stay home. I'm living with my mom at the moment. She said, no, she said, you're going to come out with us. I'm going to, you're going to come. I'm going to call you and you're going to come out with us. I she said, I have a group of friends. I have this new boyfriend. Look, my, my ex left me with with two kids, um, he left, He left, and, and, and I have this new boyfriend, and it, you have a, there is a life. She said, I'm going to call you. And sure enough, the next week she called me, and she said, uh, um, you need to be a happy mom for your son. And when she said that, I said, oh, she's so right, you know, it all just fell into place. So you can't grieve anymore. You need to come out. You need to be a happy mom. And that was what kept me going, always to be there for my son, you know, and, and that's how I, that was my recovery. And um, so the children doing it for, even if you do it for the children, you know, you have mm -hmm. to remember to do it for the kids. And you mentioned a very 
like literally a turning point. You had a turning point in your life where you stopped mm. having victim mentality. Exactly. In my case, I was literally so lost. I had lost so much weight. I was like a walking zombie with this newborn. All of a sudden I have to have all the responsibility. I have to work. We were in prime yes, COVID. I have no too. idea what's going on with my job. I still have to take care of my child. I still have to keep a roof over my child. So I was like in this new world where I had no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And then I just needed to switch. And I said, you know what, Sarah, exactly. you have a son. You have to focus on you and your son, and you will need to give your son the life you've always wanted. If it's traveling, if it's taking care of your health, if it's eating right. So I started slowly, slowly. Instead of focusing my energy on why it happened and feeling sorry for myself, I transferred that energy back to me. So it was about if I used to cook before, and then I stopped cooking because I was like in this hopeless mess. I had no idea what's going on, what day of the week it is. I started cooking for me and Sam. And out of that, nowadays, I have my book. <laughs> so that is the Shameless irony. plug there. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> that is the irony of life. That out of the worst time of my life, I actually paved the way of the successes that I have today. And back at the time when people used to tell me, Sarah, you're going to get out of this. Because truth be told, I had an amazing support system. My family, my friends, I've had friends that separated before and I used to look up to them and say, yes, there is life after divorce. But then again, I used to be afraid because in my head, I used to think like, who's going to take me with such a young baby? You know, like who would want the baggage of me and my son when he's so young? Because obviously my friends had older children, so mm. for them it was different. I still have a newborn, so that means that this new partner will have to get used to me and my son. We just come two for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever feel like that, Monica? You have you have three. I mean, yes. Wow. Yes. Um, I wanted to say before um, Francesca said um, also um, that basically. Um, when all crashed down, I think so for me, it was not just losing my husband and relationship and emotional side of it, but as I grew up as well with no dad, so in my picture perfect family, I always imagined mom and dad. Mm -hmm. That's a family tree mm -hmm. for me. So when it all went crashing down, I think so I more grieved not losing my husband, mm -hmm but losing, having dad in the household mm -hmm. for my kids. Mm -hmm. And to realize uh, that, you know, he still can be a dad. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to be separate, but yes. he still is a dad for my kids. They can still, but this is the hardest what I had to go through, basically. So, and understand that it's okay and to accept it. And then, I think so nobody, if uh, somebody will look at it, at me, um, nobody would actually tell like, oh, were you crying? Are you really bad? Because I stayed strong. I'm, I think so this is, I don't know, is it a good thing about me or it's is it a bad thing about me? Because people around me will say, oh, you're so strong. You have so much strength, you know, you never show. I never, during my cancer journey, during the divorce uh, separation, you never saw me crying at the pickup of the kids. I always dropped them. I always picked up with a smile. My kids always seen me smile and positive because what I told myself, I have to be happy, mom. Yes. I have to be happy, mom, and show that it's okay. You know, mom is happy. Even inside, I was smashed and crying and in little pieces. What if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works, in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. Meet Mineral 89 Booster. Made of millions of minerals and the iconic hyaluronic acid. It's so fresh, so pure. It boosts skin strength by 71%. So powerful, we had to call it the booster by Vichy.
Health is vital. Start with your skin. And wait, there is more. So if this is the case, and I'm asking you guys as well, I mean, grief, we've talked about grief, we've mentioned it a number of times, and you've said you had to be positive for in front of your children but that grief the grief for that dream for your values yes. you just mentioned yeah. you had mm -hmm. values mm -hmm. you yeah. wanted to have a home with a, yes. a mother and a father That's those right. are your values you've got to grieve for exactly. losing them as well yeah. mm, yes you've got to grieve for everything that you've lost you've lost your life partner you've lost uh, maybe you think you've lost your soulmate you've lost mm -hmm. somebody that you had hopefully thought you were going to spend the rest yes. of your life with. Yeah. Like so how did that grief, I guess for all of you, I really want to go into this idea of grief. Uh, and let me tell you, from my point of view, I was a disaster, I was a nightmare, and it was not pretty. But for you, for that grief, how did that then show itself? And, and however much you're further moved on, do you still have the, that odd moment when you're like... Do Sometimes I do, yes. Um, I mean, I am... I've been in therapy and I'm still in therapy and that's, that's a magic place you can be, you know, especially um, when you go through all that. Because basically you're going to trauma again. And I've been recently to trauma being in the cancer, going through cancer. So imagine me jumping from one trauma to second trauma. In fact, there were days where I said, I better go and get the cancer again. I can go through cancer again, but I don't want to go through separation. I don't want to be alone. Mm. There were times, you know, I'm being honest, you know, and then I click myself. I'm like, what are you saying, Monica? No, no, no. You know, then you go to therapy and you need to talk with someone. So they give you advice. Sometimes you need someone, I think so, from outside the family because yes. everybody... I had as well a very supportive circle, uh, friends and family. They give you advice and they're always going to tell you, you know, everything's going to be fine and so. But sometimes you need to hear a stranger. Mm. Yes, it's mm. true. Maybe mm. mm. uh, to tell you that it's okay, you know, life is a circle. You mm -hmm. go up and down. You are down now, mm -hmm. but you're going to go up walk. again. So that really helped. That really helped. Um and there are, I think so, as, as you mentioned, the grief goes from six months to two years. But in reality, I think so, it can go through all your life. Yes, you know? that's true. In my case, rather than grief, I think it was the whole healing part. So healing is very sneaky. Healing is not linear. I would have days that I would be thriving. I would be on television. I'm like this badass, you know, like I can conquer the world. Then I'll just have days when I'll just be a mess, a complete mess, because I just wake up and I say, you know, like, this is what my life is. These are the responsibilities. And especially I get days like this, or I used to get days like these in the beginning, when I used to feel that all the pressure is on me because I have to take care of Sam on my own. I have to work full time just to keep up with everything. And that is where your mind stay, stay, starts playing games on you of whether this thing happened for the for the greater good or if it's like the end of your life yeah so for example for me to even try and think of traveling with sam in the beginning okay we, we were in, in prime covid so it wasn't even an option but i always knew i wanted to travel because i loved traveling before and then i just came to a stage where i said you know what you just have to take the leap i remembered just hopping on a plane, my family was like, no, no, you're mad. You're going abroad with your son. He's still very young. How are you going to drive with a baby alone? I'm like, you know what? I'm here alone with my son every single day. We can very much do it on our own. And I went to Spain on a three hour flight alone in, with the harness and the, and the baby. I drove into, through Spain, we hopped onto beaches and I had Fantastic. the best, amazing solo holiday with my son. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and from then on, it was just like, where are we going next? Let's just find somewhere new. But, we'll but can I ask you, ladies, because uh, you, you're so empowering. You are so empowering. And, and Fran, you, you, you're one of Malta's empowering <clears throat> icons. When... But, but did you ever have that moment? Because there might be somebody watching this right now who, or listening to it who's in that phase where they're like, 
you know, this is never going to end. This is, I can't see my way out. Mm -hmm. And just so so mad. I think because, and to even ask you, Fran, you've you've moved on a long time ago, but did you, can you remember the days where you were like, there is no end to this. This is never going to get better. And when I, at the beginning, the first couple of months, it was really bad. But when the penny dropped and I realized that I had to, stop this feeling sorry and this victimization. I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I had a baby to look after, nine months old, and I had to be happy mom. I had to, I... <laughs> Listen, can I just ask you, yeah. I just want to jump in and say, victimization and feeling sorry for yourself. I just want to say, uh-huh. I, that that's a, is mm. that not a language we've been taught to use? Maybe. When we've gone it's through true. separation it's and th- the shit has hit the fan and everything's gone to pot mm. and we've got, we're in COVID with a newborn or you've just recovered from it's cancer. It is. Really, are we feeling no, sorry no, for ourselves? We, I mean, it's a grieving process. We, it, we, I think we need, we owe it to ourselves, you know, to, absolutely, you know, to to go through that and take time out and and cry and do whatever we need to you do. Had a nine months. Yes, old. exactly. So it's true. You're right. I agree I, with I just, you. I want to be really clear I about you, that true. because I just think it was very difficult. I yeah, and say. I think we should allow ourselves to say, you know what? And I, was, I really hate swearing. I didn't but, have, I didn't have anywhere think, to live. I had to find a yeah, place to live. But you I know, think that was, we should allow ourselves to true. say, life. You're right can get a bit very difficult shit. shit. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, it's true. It's and it. then, it's true. when you say that, then you can move yeah, on. So I'm true. just saying it's that true. because it's I don't you're think right. you're feeling you're right. sorry you're... for yourself at all. No, I, well, I, I don't know. I don't remember that. But I remember feeling very sad. I yeah. felt very sad. And I, I probably was a bit depressed as well at the time. Um, but obviously then when the penny drops and you say, you, you know, you don't look back again. I never looked back. I always looked forward. What am I going to do? I worked three jobs to support my son. I rented an apartment. I got students. I had, you know, so, and, and, and that really helped me to, you know, I just forgot everything. I didn't want to be bitter. I didn't want to be angry. I just wanted to be a good mom, have a life. It was really difficult. It was financially difficult. That's why I think I really um, associate with single moms because it's really tough financially if you don't have any help, if you have nowhere to live. Um, so that's why I think the Women for Women Foundation and the single mothers um, I can really associate with because I went through difficult times and I had my parents who were there always for me, let alone if you don't have, if you have no family, for example, in Malta or your parents are you're estranged from your parents, you know, so it's really difficult for some. But if you really, if it's something, you, you know, it's difficult, but you can, you have the strength, you'll find it, do it for the kids if you don't do it for yourself. I did it for the, I started off doing it for my son, but really and truly it was for me as well, mm-hmm. obviously. But mm-hmm. um, a lot of women, if you say do it for the kids, They'll do it for themselves. We're always the last ones, you know. <laughs> but, it, but there's going to be people. It's a mom syndrome, but <laughs> but there are going to be people who are not mums like myself who've also been through separation, yes, and divorce, yeah. and 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 you need to find that reason to move on. Yes, and yes. you know what? I keep thinking to myself. For for all of us around the table, there's there's you know you're three extraordinary women, and that should be enough. Forget even the, your kids for a second. The very fact that you're strong women who are giving back to the community, who are empowering other women, that should be enough. But I do want to come back to you guys and just throw this back on the table because you just did you know I, I pulled you up on it, but it's such an important point that we have that shame, we have that guilt associated, that failure associated mm. with, with separation and divorce, and we use that language. Mm-hmm. Feeling sorry for myself, you know, this sort of thing. Did, did you, is that a component, before we get to all the brilliant stuff, but did you ever feel that? I, I certainly did. I felt shame, I felt that I wasn't allowed to feel grief because I may be, despite the fact that my, my ex-husband was doing atrocious things, maybe I'd brought it on myself and maybe I had responsibility. In my case, I felt shame because no one in kind of like my circle was actually speaking about it. So I couldn't be, you know, like, now, yes, I am perhaps the first TV presenter that is speaking openly about divorce. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, we don't just air ardent, dirty laundry all over social media and say, you know what, I'm passing through this and this is what things are. People got to know eventually because obviously, you know, like our separate lives were clear and, you know, that is that. But apart from everything as well, I think we also, I spoke about the victim mentality before because automatically people 
make you feel that you kind of have to step out of it. It's like, mm. okay, this paused, you know, like you have to move yeah, on. Yeah. Especially if, for example, you are tied down with projects and, career, and your career. People will not always understand the fact that you're passing through the worst period of your life. So being an ambitious person, because as much as I wanted to be a wife and as much as I wanted to be a mother, I was always very ambitious. I always had projects going up. I always had programs lined up. So the minute this thing, this whole thing blew up, I'm like, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot host shows anymore. And the fact I had to refuse shows and I stopped television for two years because I didn't feel up to it and people could not understand it. Same as for my career. I was literally like a, wa a walking zombie. I had no idea what's going on. And my brain wasn't working. So it wasn't something temporary. It was like, okay, with the baby and all, it was something that, listen, it's like someone pulled out the rug beneath you and all of a sudden your life just crashed yes you yes, will get true. up but for that time being i just needed people to understand that you telling me come on now you have to move on as if it's nothing and as if you can just snap your fingers and you just get on with the next guy for me for example it took me four years i am now yes in a very happy and healthy relationship but it was a wild ride in between because people expected me to just jump off to the next new thing, and then that's it. And I knew that the moment I'm jumping into something new, all my trauma is going to come back up. Mm. It still comes up now, and I've been to therapy, and we speak, and we have very good communication. And at times, due to the things that I've been through, it still comes up. Let alone if I just met someone, you know, like six, seven months down the line and I just started off something. So this is another notion that people do not understand. Moving on does not necessarily mean that you need to jump on another relationship. Moving on for me was... Because <laughs> every time you speak, Sarah, I'm getting nods and shaking of the head from both sides of the table, adamantly like, like yes. this. Like this. There's so much true, agreement. Like, pe so many people used to annoy me with this thing. They used to say, you're such a beautiful girl. Come on, you'll just find someone tomorrow. I'm like, I don't want to just jump into another relationship. I need to find who Sarah is. After all this, I just need to find myself. I think, you know, this is incredibly self-aware and I don't know if it's because you mentioned therapy and you also mentioned as well, Monica, about therapy and, and getting help. I certainly didn't immediately didn't. after. You didn't know. Didn't so my result of moving on was going into another series yes. of stupid and disastrous relationships. I was relationships. going to say that as well. High five to that. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that, I, but that happens very often. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomena, you know, in fact... Um, before it happened to me, I would say, but how could she go into another bad relationship? You know, about, think about other people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was doing, I was, because I hadn't come to terms with my own self. I hadn't, um, I wasn't self-aware enough. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what I wanted, you know, what I needed, what I, what I deserved mostly, yeah, yeah. because I didn't have enough self-worth, I think. So I went into other, another bad long-term relationship which is very common, you know, unless you really find yourself and you know what you want, take the time, don't jump into another relationship. You're fine on your own. You don't need a man, you know, unless he's the right man. <laughs> but is that, <laughs> is that prospect, a serious question, you just raised something there and I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with you, Monica. Is that prospect of being on your own frightening enough to make you make a wrong decision. You obviously went to therapy. Did you choose to go to therapy? Were you daunted? I'm throwing a load of questions there, but but I think for a lot of women and men, let's face it, this doesn't happen mm. just to, to women. Sure it happens to men as well. And, and men can be equally as affected as women can. But that whole idea of being alone can be terrifying. You've been with someone, you built a life with someone. For for you, you you jumped you you jumped into the fact you said you went to therapy. Did yeah, it, was that immediate? I start yes, it was immediate. Um, however, I started the therapy thinking that we're gonna fix the relationship. Ooh. So basically, we started the therapy and separately. I mean, and then in continue, we separated, and then I just continue 
going through it. So basically, I started it before it happened. And I just continue till now, basically. It's not so often, but it helps, you know, when I feel I need the time, I really need to sit down and have one hour uh, for myself, then I go. So I think now, looking back, I'm like, thank God if I was in a therapy. I don't know how else I would come out the way I am now. Probably I wouldn't be sitting now here. Um, so I really, really like, I think so not everyone is um, able to go to therapy, but I'm sure there are a lot of places um, who would help. However, I had to, I knew I had to start therapy when I went through cancer or after cancer and I never did. And I think so that was the biggest mistake I'd done because it is recommended and everybody knows, you know, even you go in hospital and there is so much help and uh, God bless all the nurses and everyone, you know, they always would offer you, you know, if you need to talk, if you need help, we are here for you. But I never did. Probably not most, probably, I don't know the percentage, mm. people wouldn't. And when it's too late, then you realize, you know, that I should have done it. I already went to trauma. I should have fixed that trauma. Now I have to fix two traumas, <laughs> you know, yes. I have to go <laughs> double. Um, so, um, yeah, I think therapy definitely yes. thumbs yes. up. No, thumbs same up. with me. And to be honest, like, for example, for you, Francesca, not having a therapy, not having even probably, it wasn't talked so about I, back that time. Was a long time ago. Exactly. 25 years ago. Only recently you hear people so. going through therapy, isn't it? I'm just feeling old right I now. Know, I'm sitting over here with Fran just going, oh my good grief. <laughs> it, it, well, I mean, in fairness, I don't know about you because you were here and I was in the UK, but, um, you know, people did go to therapy for various things, but they generally speaking, if somebody got divorced, it wasn't considered, it wasn't considered bad enough. No. People no. got divorced. And, and it, like you said, Sarah, it was like, okay, come on, let's get over it. Come on, move on. And in actual fact, what I realize now is that it is, what is this, seven stages of grief. You're going to pass through them whether you whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. You're going yes. to get angry. You're going to be despondent. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to think that there's no hope. You're going to go through all of that. And you have to pass through that. You have no choice. They will happen anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you might as well embrace it, recognize it, and then move through to come to the other side. And of course, we all know sitting at this table with these beautiful women that there is life after. And the life Life after can be bigger and brighter and more inspiring than it was Mine, before. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Would you, <laughs> <laughs> but, but did you ever, Fran, is a really interesting one because these ladies, you, we've got a real mix here yes. because Monica was already in therapy because of her circumstances. Sarah, you decided obviously that you wanted to go to therapy. Yes. Fran, you didn't. But was I there a later go. point that you yes. said, okay, let me go and heal? So I didn't go to therapy at the time. It wasn't a big thing. Um, but um, when I was in the next bad relationship um, and I wanted to leave, my partner was didn't want me to leave at the time. So he said, let's go to therapy, to couples counseling. And I went to please him. But I, in my mind, I was going there not to make the relationship, but to listen, to, to understand. I had never been to therapy. I said, I have nothing to lose, you know. And out of that, I realized that even more I had to leave him. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say this, you know, that therapy, go with, if you go with an open mind, mm -hmm. you know, um, she, the therapist was very good and she made me see a lot of things about myself that mm -hmm. I was doing, that I had issues in myself that were making me go through these bad relationships, you know, where I wasn't empowered. I wasn't, I was very apologetic. I was very, I was a very different person <laughs> where I was blaming myself for everything or I was with mm -hmm. narcissists who blamed me for everything, yeah. me, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when I, when the therapy really helped me to see myself in a different light and to say I deserve better, I'm worth it and I always say this on the group as well, that you're worth it. Don't stay in bad relationships because there is life. Yes, it's difficult to leave. There was a lot of shame for me. Again, another failed relationship. Society, you know, I'm going to move my son again out of another relationship, you know. So now he's seven, eight years old, you know. And my friend Christine came to the rescue again. <laughs> 
Bless her. I know. She, well, she, <laughs> she's she's so so it's true. It's true. Should we get some sainthood for her or something? It so sounds amazing. It's true, seriously. So know? how did she come to the rescue? So I was, um, we were living together at the time with my aunt partner and she was, she had an apartment that she said, listen, like I will rent my apartment at a very good price if you need to leave. I trust you. I know you look after it. And... And that's where I got the courage to, I said, I can't do this. It was difficult, you know, the shame of again leaving, not having been financially enough to live on my own, you know, and but I, I, again, so, and I managed it. And sure enough, I'm much better off. I'm remarried. I'm coming up to my 10th wedding anniversary. So. <laughs> and obviously beaming. I mean, I know yourself and your hubby and, and yes. you're very, very happy. Yes. <laughs> You said something there that I think is uh, completely worth mentioning. Um, I remember two two and uh, little side stories that I'm going to share. I remember when I was in the relationship, um, probably about well, you know the relationship that I was in, and a friend had come to stay, and she said her and her husband sat down with me, and they said to me, "We just want to tell you we don't think this is right for you." We think this is, and I was living with him yes, I and I was committed. I was in a foreign country. I'd only been here a short period of time. And they said, this isn't right for you. You're taking a lot that you shouldn't take. Now, in the past, when I was in a marriage and I came out of that marriage, I had a lot of people turning around. And I don't know if you identify with this, but they turned around and they were like, well, we didn't think it was going to last. And we didn't think you should have been mm. in that relationship. And I, at that point said, if you don't have the guts to say it, when I'm in it, don't say it when I'm out. Because in the same time, my best friend had been in a, a relationship. She was getting married. I'd found out that her um, her fiance had been cheating on her. And I put my friendship on the line and I said, sweetness, I gotta tell you, your fiance is cheating on you. She ended up marrying him and it cost me my friendship for eight years. But when she found out and I've mentioned it on the show before, that she, uh, she, that he had been cheating on her and there was no doubt that he had. She, I was the first person that she came to. She said, you were right, I'm sorry, can we pick up a friendship? And I said, yes, of course we can. Because we all know what that situation is like. When someone has to break that news to you, we know that you're not necessarily in the right place in the right mind. But going back to what you were saying and your friend offered you some a way out. Mm. And I would say as women, we have to we have to mm -hmm. we have to and it might cost your friendship for eight years like it did with mm -hmm. me but you have going to have respect so if you're in a situation i'm not encouraging women to be nosy parkers and mm -hmm. stick their nose in <laughs> to to other people's business where it's not not uh, needed but i think we do need yes, to support each too. other and especially if you see abuse if you see an, a partner abusing speaking badly in front of the <gasps> children or shouting at his at your friend or misbehaving and and if it's a woman doing it to a man as well i mean this is you know yeah you know it's respect you know i it should be a given and we should point it out to our friends and say like listen you know this is not on you, he shouldn't be talking to you like that or you shouldn't be talking to him like that and you know especially in front of the children you know or if you know other stuff that he's doing you know yeah. maybe drop a hint here and there just that she deserves better you know I think if you say listen you deserve better you know yeah. you're worth it why are you staying for this you know and and so many of us stay a lot of us stay yeah. see the stories every day we stay because we stay for the kids we stay to keep the peace we stay because we don't want to upset our parents we don't want to upset the grandparents you know and and we stay and mostly the women are the ones who stay you, know? you just said something and I want to, I don't have any experience with this part of the topic, so I'm going to throw it at, mm. at you guys, because you say we stay for the sake of the children. A children, I mean, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because I'm talking to you three ladies, but do you believe that children are happier 
out of a bad marriage than staying in a marriage for the sake of their happiness. Does that sentence make sense at yes. all? But you know what, what I'm trying sense. to say. Yes. And I, I believe that I'd rather be separated and they have an understanding that mummy and daddy are better off not being together and we have separate lives rather than trying to fix something that is unfixable. I, I don't believe if, like you said before, if one person is not willing to put in the work, the other person can bend over backwards and they can do backflips and somersaults. The thing will never work. It takes two to tango. And unfortunately, all you're teaching your kids, if you see that your partner is not willing to actually help you or like fix whatever needs to be tackled, your children are just learning how to kind of get abused in a way. <laughs> no, I, I, but I'm going to throw this at Monica because Monica's got a handful. She, you were pregnant when you separated and you had two children already. There must have been a moment where you were like, you know, maybe I should stay because this is going to be yes. really tough. Mm. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Yes, I, a lot of times it crossed in my mind, especially, I think so in my case, there are so many different cases, you know, when if it's involved... Um, physical abuse or even mental abuse it will be different um, um it's not my um, area to talk especially for me thinking we are good we are family mm. like we have love like mm. you know like what's wrong okay sometimes we don't spend time with each other what's a big deal a big you know deal, i mean exactly so, uh, this world is busy you know i mean i'm doing this he's doing this so for me Yes, I thought like, yes, this can work. We cannot, we have two small kids, a baby on the way. I mean, we have to stay, you know, we have to work this throughout. But again, it takes two. You know, I can say maybe I wanted to put work and work the side or at least try it. I think so in my mind, I always said to myself, at least if I try, mm -hmm. yes, if I try, if I do my best and let's say it doesn't work after six months, two, two weeks, whatever, I know at least I try my best mm -hmm. and I can tell my kids, yes. you know, I tried. I was there, I gave all the effort, but it didn't work. And it's fine. But that's me. The relationship takes two. So um, if there is no willingness from the other side, if another side, it can be again, it can be um, a man or a woman or whatever, then, I mean, it's not going to work out. And now... Now, me seeing my family at the stage where we are separate, I can see like, okay, actually I think so, the kids are happier this way. They see daddy more than they ever did when we were together. So in a way, it didn't scare me that much because I see them growing and seeing mommy's happy and daddy's happy. So it worked yes. better. <laughs> You know, did you have to build strategies into how to deal? I'm going to ask Fran first because I'm assuming that your ex had would, still wanted to maintain a relationship with your son or not? Yes, yes. So yeah. how do you build a strategy into that? Because I'm just I'm I'm thinking again like I'm learning. This is a learning curve for me because I don't have kids, but. When you're going through that whole grieving process, maybe you're going through postnatal depression, maybe you're still dealing with the trauma of cancer, and then you're still presented with that person that you wanted to build a life with, that you want, you've got a nine month old, you wanted to build that life with them, you have to see them. I mean, I'm really, really, really blessed in that regard. Once he was out of my life, That's I funny. was out of the country, I never saw him again <laughs> until the day I got engaged, which was hilariously <laughs> funny. But. <laughs> But you have to deal with them. What, yes. what is there, for anyone that's listening or watching to this, did, did you have a strategy? Do you have a strategy I to deal with I think mine was always um, don't blame the kid. You know, don't get the kid involved. Um, he has nothing to do with it. He's innocent. So I always try to keep a very, very civil relationship with my ex. We're still very civil till today. We're good. We have a good relationship. And um, I think it has served my son well, you know. Um, they have nothing, they're not to blame. They have no blame in this. They were never asked to be born, to be part of this hurt. So always trying to make sure that anything I did was, my strategy was what is the best for my son. 
you know, always. Um, where is he going to least be hurt? How is he going to best to deal with this? So I, for me, it was an easy um, stuff. We never had, my, my ex never beat me or did anything terrible. You know, it was just something that happened. We fell out of love or whatever you want to call it. But it was, it was painful because, as we said, you know, it's, there was a dream. You know, it was something it's like you're going on a path and all of a sudden you crash into a very, very bad crash into a wall, you know, and everything falls apart and you have to recover. But um, my strategy was always what's best for my son, you know, and how can I make sure that I don't um, influence him in, in my hurt and my suffering. Sarah's nodding and agreeing with you completely. <laughs> but I want to ask you, because you must have gone through excruciating emotional pain. Yes. At the same time, how, and you, and you have a new child. Exactly. How, how, what, is, what is your coping strategy when you have to face that person? I think that was one of the biggest issues I used to have because all of a sudden I just have to dissociate my feelings towards this person. Because obviously before we mentioned the bit, we mentioned the fact that you are angry at this person. So for the longest time, I was angry at this human being for just exiting our life without any, you know, like warnings or anything. So for the time being, I used to feel angry that I have to co-parent with this person that decided to leave. But once I actually withdrew those emotions and I was actually thinking about Sam first, what's best for my son? My son depends on the fact that he needs both parents in his life. Whether or not we have, both of us have partners, my son still needs to have his dad in his life because he is his biological dad. So the minute I got that understanding of, listen, you two are two separate people. He is just the father of your son. My life changed. How long did that take? That took around a year and a half. Okay. Which is not easy because throughout that period, I even tried to actually fix the marriage, which didn't obviously work out. <laughs> but from my end, like, uh, like we were saying before, the fact that you try and that you have no regrets of actually trying to do your best and you know that you did your what's best for you and for your son is actually empowering for you to say, you know what, I've done my best. This was not my fault. Like you were saying before, I have nothing, I, I cannot blame myself for this happening. Because obviously people might look at you as an outsider and they'll say, like you were saying as well, they'll say, you kind of had something to do with it. He wouldn't just up and leave. Mm -hmm. Where obviously everyone has this, the arguments, everyone has disagreements. So I'm sure at some point I've had some share of it as well. But then again, not to the extent of you actually abandoning your family. So going back to your question about how I deal with it, there are no set rules and regulations. You just have to obviously go with the flow of the kids. And when people actually, because obviously my social media, like you were saying, automatically people just feed off the fact that you're a single mother. Mm -hmm. And I actually have people messaging me, telling me like, how did you do it? How am I going to look at him and just not feel anything? And I used to say the same thing. I used to tell Claudia, my friend, I used to tell her like, how am I going to deal with this person for the rest of my life? I still have 18 years like facing him every single week. <laughs> how <laughs> these ladies how like, am I yes, going to do it? Yes. But she used to tell me one single thing. She used to tell me, Sarah, there will come a time in your life where will, you will look at him and he will be a complete stranger. Now, four years down the line, I look at him and I'm like, damn, she was right. <laughs> and isn't that a liberating, I mean, whether or not you have children or whether it's just a, you know, it's a separation, it's a breakup, it's a divorce. That moment when you stop caring, when yes. you wake up and you think to yourself, you know what, I could bump into them and it won't hurt anymore. That's, That's the best. My problem in the beginning was the anger. I held mm. on to anger and yeah. resentment. And that used to occupy my brain so much. I was ruminating about all these things, like why did this happen? Why, you know, like why did you do this to me? And the minute I let that go, I was a free bird. I'm like, okay, you know what? There's life, this happened, but this is the past now. Now we're moving on. And I'm wondering whether, and, and Monica, maybe you can tell me, because I'm wondering whether that journey, that part of that journey, 
is different for everybody. But sure. the destination, that point where they go, you know, what, I don't, yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. It, I, I don't care. I think for everybody, they will arrive at that one day, no matter how long it takes. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's four years, maybe it's even more. I don't think we have to put a time scale to it. Mm-hmm. But one day they will get there. Mm-hmm. And you have to just keep in mind that that will happen. There is a day and it will come. Sure. But it might just be a different story for you than it is for me or for Monica or Fran. And it's their loss. That's a very <laughs> hard one to get to. It's true, but you realize that, you know, when you, when you say that to yourself, you're feeling better already, you know. You know that you, you're going to be better off. You, you don't want to be with someone who doesn't want to be with you. Yeah, but, but didn't, okay, to be practical, mm, and I'm going to ask you, Monica, first mm, of all, and you don't have to answer this, but, <laughs> but don't you ever get, did you never get that feeling in your stomach that they would be happy with somebody else and you just hated that thought? I really have been through that a couple of times. In my case, no. Oh, no, no. Yeah, no, me neither. Because I knew that this person. <laughs> 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 are hanging out together. We know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, yeah, Listen, I, mean, I will just caveat that by saying even with somebody who cheated on me, the, my biggest fear was that I was losing out and they moved on and they were going to be happy and I was going to be stuck in this hole and like this forever. Now, we've put that on the table already. We know that's not the case. But you do go through a wild amount yes, of emotions. Yes, you go through that. You go through that phase. I went. Um, and again, it takes time. Especially in my case was that I got, I got, we got out from the relationship. So I was a single mom and um, my ex-husband went straight away to other relationship. So obviously, as we mentioned before, it will be so much easier if the kids wouldn't be involved. Mm -hmm. I can leave the country. Bye bye. I don't see you again. Never ever again. And even the griefing process, healing and all the stuff, I think so it will come much more faster. When kids are involved it's totally different story you have to see them Mm -hmm. every week a few times a week you know so putting that emotions again Mm -hmm. sarah said until i learned to put anger and hope for Mm -hmm. me was hope Mm -hmm. i was hanging on the hope still hoping Mm -hmm. you know he will try and Mm -hmm. you know he'll come back we can still work it out when i realized and I learned to let hope go. Mm-hmm. Then yes, yes. acceptance yes. and all the healing started. Mm-hmm. Understanding, self-worth, learning. Actually then started learning about myself and yes. getting myself back, which was another mm-hmm. eye-opener because I yes. was like, I'm always was like this. I'm always mm-hmm. doing this and this. And now the, I'm like, no. It's like a new you. Yes, it's like new you. I was like, <laughs> yeah can do this. I know how I don't do yes. this. I'm like, I'm learning totally different things about myself. I'm like, where I lost that over mm-hmm. all yes. those years? Mm-hmm. Like what? It's like a new awakening. Yes. So I think um, as you got me back to a question that seeing the other part happier. Yes, I went through that. Seeing things they're doing where we meant to do this. Like, why we couldn't have done that? We couldn't be happy if we'd done that. We didn't do that. You know, you start comparing yourself. I'm like, what? Like, why? Why is it happening to me then? You have mm-hmm. to go through that phase. I think so. I loved what yeah, I loved what you good. said. I loved the fact you said you had to. I'm going to paraphrase you, but you had to let the hope die. Yes. And yeah. you have to grieve for that. The hope had to die. You know, we always use hope as a positive Mm -hmm. word, but when it's misdirected, it's going to trap you and keep you in a bad place. And I love the fact that you said, I've got to let go of that hope Mm -hmm. because I think that is such a beautiful way of describing how to move on. Every again, every situation might be different. Yes, of course, going somebody to say. might not have hope or doesn't mm-hmm. want to have mm-hmm. hope. You know, they'll be happy to be out. Mm-hmm. You know, and realizing, okay, thank God I am out. In my situation, I I I hold the yes, hope yes. for for pretty long I time. I think so as well. It's different Especially, to us who didn't have. You had that life together, had life of, together. of with the kids together, a happy family yeah. where you didn't have, you know, it was the very different to, to, 
different to mine. We didn't have and hers didn't because have we didn't have life we didn't yeah. have that as previous, a family. You know, exactly, it was just like, me and him. Exactly. So even my son, my son doesn't know us as us being mm. together. We yes. were always separate, so he doesn't really acknowledge the fact. He just mm. knows mommy and daddy to have two separate mm. homes, yes. so he knows that. But yes. but even not even someone who doesn't have kids, I I still had invested in this relationship. I invested in this marriage. I invested in in being with this person and I hoped, mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember I was paying for them to move into, a, I paid for the, the flat that they moved into for a, for six months so that we could then try and be together. I, it cost me a fortune to pay for my flat and their flat so that they were looked after, they were looked after mm -hmm. so that we, because I was carrying on this hope, because I was hoping mm -hmm. that if I invested enough, it might make a change. They might change. They might come back. We might be able to resurrect this. So I'm not entirely sure it's just about kids and about family. Mm, I think, you're right. you know, for me, and I'm going to throw this on the table as well, I also didn't want to go through the embarrassment and the shame. And I went, didn't want to go through that journey of having to say to my in-laws, to my friends, to my brother and sister-in-law to my own family, this is over. This is, this is broken. And I didn't want to say that. I really didn't want to say that. And I didn't want to have to go through that situation. Was that an easy conversation for you guys? I mean, you, you talk about very supportive families. But... In my case, in the beginning, it was about trying to fix it. By the end of it, it was like, Sarah, what are you doing? So you need to get out because this pattern is going to keep happening. So you're not doing any good for you or your son. So then it was this counterintuitive thing that you guys should be backing me up with my decision rather than trying to push me away. Whereas now I understand that they were seeing things from a different perspective. They were seeing how I was changing. They were seeing how I was getting shrunk again after kind of like giving myself the standing up again and trying to pave my way again this person was like literally sucking me back into this whole other world <laughs> so and that is where i liked the fact that she mentioned um we kind of like find ourselves again mm -hmm. i found my identity after i actually filed for divorce it wasn't even about the separation because the separation happened and then I gave him the, the second chance. After that, I said, you know what? This is a closed chapter. I am filing for divorce myself. And that was the thing that empowered me the most. So the first separation initially happened because of whatever happened. We tried again and it didn't, obviously things couldn't work out. And then I decided to file for divorce and move on in my own way. And that is where I started getting to know myself in a different way, that I liked sports, again, like I used to do before. But when I was in the relationship, I, like you were saying as well, I was so attuned to what he needs, to what the household needs, that I need to be at home to cook, that I need to prepare all the things. So I was like shrinking myself to make this relationship work, where I was constantly pouring in to this cup, but no one was pouring into mine. You see, now you really nicely led on to sort of the next, <laughs> the next part of this. I always wonder if people are looking at my notes, mm -hmm. but I wanted to move on. We've talked a lot about the grief. We've talked a lot about the, the, the struggle that you go through, but we started off, and I want to come full circle back to where we started, which is the journey. At, not, I'm not going to say end, but the, the part of the journey that you're at right now. Mm -hmm which is obviously incredibly positive. And you just said you found yourself because you made your own choice. Exactly. And there really is something valuable in that when you decide you're, you're not being forced into, you're not a victim, you're standing there and you're saying, I make this choice for me and I'm choosing me over anything else. And that is incredibly empowering, just as you said. But what else, and I'm going to ask both of you as well, what else do you take, what else was the positives of coming out of this situation? What did you find, you, you mentioned sports, but mm -hmm. what did you find most empowering? What did it give you? What did you, what do you have now that you didn't have then? I have the ability to take care of myself. 
So self-care nowadays, I understand it. Back then, I used to think that self-care is like, I'll call the girls, let's go for a spa day. No, self-care is literally taking the time. If I need to go for a walk and hear your podcast, I will do that. <laughs> I thank you. If I need to go for a gym session alone because I've had a very stressful week, I know that I just need this time for myself, for my mental health, for my physical health, and I will just take that time. If it's creating new hobbies, if it's meeting new people, if it's nowadays, you know, like spending time with a new partner, that is another thing. That was another hurdle for me. Trusting First of all, trusting someone new, but mostly trusting myself into choosing someone who's good for me and Sam, which is not easy. So for the beginning of my relationship, in fact, most people didn't even, didn't even know that I'm in a relationship because I, I was so afraid that mm. something's going to happen again. So now that I'm actually into this relationship, I know the positive and what it really feels like to be in a healthy relationship where I have a voice. I can actually speak about what I'm feeling and instead of this person shutting down and just leaving the, the room, he'll tell me, you know what, uh, we're in this together. I know you're stressed right now. Just let's take a breather. We'll come back to this in five minutes. And I'm like, wow, did this yeah, just happen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wow moment, right? Like, for example, a, a thing about trust is, and that is where I mentioned trauma before. I did my healing part. I did all my therapy part, but trauma remains there. Yeah. So when people tell you, no, you've healed, healing is never an end destination. Yeah, yeah. It's a journey. Yeah. And along the way, you and your new partner perhaps need to find a way how to mesh your lives together in a way that you will feel supported and secure, which is not easy at times. Because, for example, my partner has conferences and stuff abroad. So during the first conference and during his first trip, I'm like, what is going to happen? Is, he goes, is this going to happen all over again? Mm -hmm. And now he knows that by reassuring me and by calling me often mm -hmm. and things like that, I will actually feel better. Does it save me from that happening? Perhaps no, but he knows that I need it mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. is willing to give it to me, which helps. If it's with Sam, I just see this incredible man taking care of a son that is not even his own. And I'm in awe about him. I'm like, I look at him literally on Sundays. I just stay like this. I'm like, how is he doing it? I love the fact you keep getting teared up. I really do. <laughs> it's so, we always have tears. I never ever bring blimmin' tissues. I'm need to get yes, tissue need sponsors. <laughs> anybody, any tissue sponsors that are watching this, please do get in we touch with the We need them, show. especially when we're speaking about kids. Absolutely. Yeah. But I want to go back. I mean, it's I love the fact that you're so passionate about talking about somebody new who mm -hmm. who is with your son. But going back to you, mm -hmm. do you think that that is something you could have done if you were still in your marriage? Because no. I want to think, I want to identify, I want to ask you guys to identify things that you can now do that you could not have done if you were in that previous relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like a really case, easy I'm... thing to do a book, but why could you not have done that? In my case... I was always the one trying to push him to thrive in his career. So I always took the, the, the back burner because I always knew that I'm going to have a baby, so I'm going to be at home with the baby. So I'm just going to kind of stall my career in order to be with the child. So I'm helping you to grow while I stay on the side. Whereas when the separation actually came to terms and all, I knew that, listen, I need to put my socks up because now all the financial responsibility is on to me. And I want to give my son the life that I've always wanted to give him. If that meant that I have to work full time, do television, do Instagram, and do a bunch of other things, I know my time is going to be very, very limited with my friends and social activities, but I'm going to make it happen. So these things I couldn't do once I was married because I was always focusing on what he needs. Whereas now I'm focusing on what I need. And thankfully, my partner supports me in a way that if, for example, I just come up with the randomest idea of, for example, <laughs> doing something for charity. <laughs> if I wanted to do something for charity when I was, when I was still married, probably he'd just scoff and tell me, for charity, why? Why are you laughing, Fran? What, what, yeah, what resonated there? No, because Women for Women, it was like... Joe, my husband, you know, I was like in the kitchen and I said, as she said, entertains her silly ideas, you know, he, I said, I think I want to create a group for women only. 
He said, that's a brilliant idea. I was like, is it really? You're sure? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know what I mean? And this is where, you know, you when someone's always encouraging, it's always positive. You know, he makes you feel that you can do everything. You know, you have that person who trusts you. You trust him. They want the best for you, you know. This is something that um, I really try to, when you find your soulmate, you know, I think, you know, on a, you know that they want the best for you and you want the best for them. Vice versa, you know, it's about equality in, in the house, you know, it's not, you know, it's not equality, you have to do this and I have to do that. It's just that you both uh, valued, your, your worth is valued, what you, your ideas, what you are about is, you're not contradicted con constantly, you're not blamed constantly, you're valued in your relationship, you know, you're listened to. I want, I want to take a tiny mm -hmm. step back because we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth in just a minute, but I want to take a step back because I think it is, um, I think it's mindful just to, to concentrate for a second on what you as an individual mm -hmm. gets out of exiting a, a, a relationship that's not working as you as an individual, mm -hmm. because we don't want to yes. come out of a relationship saying, okay, I'm looking for the next relationship. No, 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 definitely no, no. not. For you, Monica, what did, what have you, how have you grown? What have you gained? Where have you, has this journey taken you as a person that you were not able to explore before? Um, in my situation, I think so similar to even to Francesca's, um, I was a um, housewife and I was happy about it. You know, it always was... Um, it's better to stay for me home and look after the kids. And the bread bringer is my husband. But what I think so, it's me as well. I'm a very stubborn person. And I never <laughs> like accepted <that. laughs> help. Never. Even if it used to be offered, I'll be like, no, I'm fine. It's okay. I can do it. I can do it. Like, I always put in my mind that I am a housewife, so this is my duty to cook, to clean, to do errands and stuff. This is, this is my job. This is how I contribute to the household, okay? Um, so to have time for myself, I used to have time for myself. I cannot really complain. Like if I wanted to go for a walk, I went for a walk. If I wanted to go for coffee, I went for the coffee. But now I understand and realize when I'm out, now when I accept help because I needed help, I accepted it because I needed it. Mm -hmm. Like I cannot, I'm like how am I gonna do it with three kids from newborn? Like I have to, there is no other way, I have to, you know? So especially I think so having a newborn, like thinking about my first child and leaving my first child to someone, I'm like, no freaking way, no, like yes. I can do it. Now I'm giving my kids to a babysitter, to Nana Nano, it's okay, mm -hmm. you know? I had to have an errand, I went, I did it, even though it's fine, they're all healthy, they're yes. the legs and all arms and everything, you know? Accepting that and seeing that it's okay, you can let it go, let go. you can take help and work on yourself, enjoy yourself. This is what it took me after going through this journey. I think so, if I would have stayed, we just kept going the same pattern, you know? I think so. I think she hit on a very good point there. Um, I don't know if you, the, in my time when I was younger, there was the first wife's club. I don't know if you've ever seen it. The oh thing. my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think a lot of us women, I, I, wasn't a, 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 I wasn't a housewife, but I can see that we can lose ourselves in the housework, in the, and 
um, I don't want to self-blame, but I think we lose ourselves and we, um, we don't put enough effort into what we want. So we, we forget who we are. It's all about the kids. That's, you know, it's, and every story is different, okay? So everyone's different because we didn't touch on that. that. We're three people and we all had yes. three different stories. The housewife, is nothing wrong with being a housewife, but being a housewife doesn't mean you're a slave. You should still be respected, have your time to go to the gym, do whatever you want, the sports. It's, it's known that there's a deficit. Men have much more free time than women mm -hmm. if they're married, even if they're both working or it's because the women do all the caring. So what I want to say is about um, staying at, being a stay-at-home mom is fine, but don't forget that always have a backup plan because if you're suddenly... Yeah. alone and separation is what happens you end up sometimes the husband has all the money in his hands you have no idea where he's saving it what he's doing he gives you an allowance you know that's half of that money if you don't have a separation of assets that's half yours whatever he's earning you know so you have to make sure that you have a plan b because this is what we see a lot if you've never worked if you haven't worked and you have to go out to work when you're 40 45 50 it's even more difficult so have a plan B, study something, you know, if you, if you don't want to work, you want to be a stay-at-home mom, use that time to study, to grow, to be self-aware, to, you know. We have a, a stay-at-home mom's show in mm. this season, in season four, and, it, and it's, it's an incredibly mm. empowering and very, very uh, eye-opening mm. show. Uh, three amazing mm. women who are strong, educated, incredible women who, who themselves also they chose to be stay-at-home mums it was a decision they made with their partner but they also talk about this loss of identity mm -hmm. but in fairness i think that every time i've talked to mums throughout the she word the loss of identity is something that Becoming. is always on the radar and is always there in the background and it's always something that comes up because you're your identity changes because you become part of somebody else as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, I would really recommend, mm -hmm. just touching on what you said, go and see that show. Yes, it's would. phenomenal. Whether you're a stay at home mum or whether you're a mum who's gone out to work, or if you're not even a mum at all, it's really eye opening and very, very uh, powerful. I'm going to ask you guys, I can't believe it, but we are heading towards oh the end of this discussion i know can you believe it but i do want to just touch you guys are so positive i'm really really excited that this has not been a, despite the fact we're all dressed in black this has not been a morbid show at all we've been very brutally honest about the process but we've kept saying there will be a day a day will come mm -hmm. there is a time where for every single woman who has gone through this process and man there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Let me just say one thing. You have to put in the hard work as well. Mm -hmm. You have to work on yourself. It doesn't just happen by sitting back and saying, oh, what happened to me, Shidrali, you know? Mm -hmm. You have to put in the... And you have to want to go to the therapy, do the hard work, look at yourself and say, mm, maybe I should do something different. I should, you know? You have to examine the situation as well. I don't know if you agree with me. You can't... Yeah. It's, it's hard work. It doesn't yeah. just... It's 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 all, it doesn't happen. happen on its own. Yeah. You know, it's all about looking into yourself. How can I do this? How am I going to make it work? How am I going to do it better? And, and have... Believe in yourself. You can do it, you know. Mindset. Exactly, the mindset, the mindset. Exactly, the mindset. Exactly, that's the word. Sorry. Absolutely. No, no, no. I completely, and I'm so glad mm. that you said that. Mm. But I also agree, and going back to something that Sarah said, uh, probably about 45 minutes ago, go back to that point, mm. where <laughs> you said where people were like, come on, pull out yes. of it, pull out of it. Every single person who's going through this journey is an individual, and their that's journey different. is different. individually different. tailored yes. to them. Yes. So it might take you, I mean, that's why it says the grieving process yes. can be six months, it can be two years and you can still be going through the trauma 10 20 years later where there is no time limit to that so absolutely you do have to put in the work mm. but i don't think anyone should say okay after six months i should be moving on i should be there because i think for different people have different different exactly. journeys everyone has a different journey and every story is different you know you heard absolutely. three different stories here but every story is different you what to take out of this is that like you said i think there's life after you can, you know, you don't feel like it's the end of the world because you will be feeling like that. Mm -hmm. It's true. 
I mean, you will get better. Because I did feel it was like the end of the world. Like I crashed into a very big bad wall and was totally injured in all senses, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I wanted mm. to ask you in a second, I'm going to ask each of you to, to, to kind of put onto the table mm. your closing thoughts, your encouraging words like this. But I'm going to give you a minute to think about that because I'm actually going to share. I don't ever do this, but I'm going to share my own thoughts. I mean, I came out of my... My divorce, at tw my marriage came out at 28 and it was only when I was at 45 that I, I had that awakening, that moment where I said to myself, this is why I keep repeating the same behavior over and over again. And I had that, that awakening, 45. So I was not uh, just a few years out of my relationship. I was a long way out of my relationship <laughs> and there was a whole ton of really bad ones in between. But I did have that moment. And that moment was, you are important, you are a person, and you matter. And you have to stop giving everything that you have to somebody else over and over again. You are where it starts mm -hmm. and it was a very painful look at myself and it was very painful dissecting what mm. my behavior had led me to and why it was like that and rebuilding myself from scratch mm. of 45 which quite frankly is a little tiny bit scary <laughs> but it's never too late exactly. no it's not you know, it's what happened to me at 38 so I really understand you you know and um it was the same thing you know realizing I'm worth it I deserve better I can do this. I, I, I matter, like you said. Exactly. I went through that. But that's why I said you need the hard work. Like you said, it yeah. was a process. You have to take a look at yourself, an honest look, and, and see what you've done, who you've been up to the past, who you want to become, who you want to be. Learn boundaries, you know, boundaries. I was always the one who give, 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 yeah. you know. And, and then when you realize, okay, I, you know, this is bit crazy I'm always the one giving and I'm always the one there for everyone you know and I'm worth it I deserve to get back what I give at a minimum you know that's the least <laughs> you know not always giving and never getting anything in return we all, 38. We all, yeah 38 well it's, it is mm -hmm. never too late mm -hmm. and I will say there's one other thing that whilst you guys are thinking mm -hmm. about what you Sorry. wanted to, to finish no no so when you want to what, what do you want to finish up with we had this conversation I'm going to cheat the uh, cheat and I'm going to steal this from all of you because we had this conversation before we even sat down this around this table I think the one asset that is the most valuable that anybody has that we as women so often learn to override, it's our gut feeling. Our gut feeling tells us when it's time to throw in the towel. Our gut feeling tells us when it's time to keep going. Our gut feeling tells us when something is wrong and when something is right. And we override that. I had learned 45 years to override <laughs> that. And when you listen to it, you can look back and go, I knew that was a bad one. I knew that was never going to work. I knew what I was doing. And you can sort of look back at it almost humorously uh, and just say, there was no way that was going to work because your gut had already told you this was never going to be a success. So those are my closing thoughts. I never do it. I never <laughs> leave closing thoughts, but I feel very passionately about this topic. For you guys, closing thoughts, anything that you want to throw right there into the middle of the table? Sarah's looking with a big smile on her face. <laughs> no, I think most of it would, like we were saying before, most of the time people expect us to just move on and just get on with our lives and as if nothing ever happened and things of the sort. I just want to tell anyone that is actually passing through this, please take your time. If it means that you're going to stay alone for a while, it's okay to be alone. As scary as it might sound, it's okay to be alone. Day by day, things will get better. You will find your passions again. You will find your smile back again. Mm -hmm. In my case, it was putting a bit of weight on again because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't eating. So it's a matter of refocusing yourself, refocusing everything onto you again. So if you want to do something that you can actually feel empowered doing it, please go and do it. If you want to pick up a new hobby, a new sport, go and do it. The, the, the feeling and like the satisfaction that you actually take, for example, for me, it was actually doing a, a charity project for the first time. It was, you know, like always a dream of mine. And I used to say, oh no, maybe I'll put it on hold. Maybe it will be a flop. 
And last year I launched it and this year I'm doing it again. So for me, these things actually fuel my life. Whether or not I was in a relationship, I was still fueling myself because that is who Sarah is. If I'm passionate about cooking, I will just post on Instagram. I have, you know, like a community that actually keeps on interacting with me and tells me, you know what, I like this, I like this. I actually try and empower women. If you want to go for a run and you don't have people to keep your kids, try and do activities with your kids. Mm. Because that's another thing, like having a kid 24-7 with you is no, it's no joke. <laughs> I can vouch for that. So I always try to incorporate Sam with me and try and do things that actually involve him whilst I'm doing my passions. So at times people tell you, you know, you need to take kids into a, a kid's area. No, I take my kid hiking. I take my kids nice. <laughs> running with the stroller and everyone's looking at me like, what is she doing? But that is who I am and that is who, that is not who I was. That is the new Sarah, Sarah 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, I love that. Your resilience has really profoundly inspired me, but Monica, yours as well. I'm hugely inspired by your resilience and your strength. Any thought, I mean, I, I just want to, also just say that these are very real stories. Mm -hmm. They're not sort of fluffy, lovely, everything's going to be okay, you're going to be all right. You've shared the pain yeah. and the heartache. So your resilience is, is something that any woman can achieve. But your resilience is, is fantastic. What is your leaving thought? My your closing thought, I would say, uh, I'm going to repeat myself probably again, but um, I constantly, I'm still working on it, but being positive and putting the positive mindset, this is what helped me to go through the cancer. And I think so through the cancer, I learned it, to be honest. Um, just always, I know, I know um, you have shitty days, you have days of tears, days where you cannot get up from the bed probably. I mean, in my case, obviously motivation was kids. So I think so sometimes you might say it's easier because yeah, you can, kids. when your kids are involved, it's kind of easier. You like, you put your mindset, I have to do this for the kids. I have to do it for the kids. You know, I cannot cry in the morning. I have to get up and go. But if you don't have kids, you have to find something in yourself to keep you going. So positive mind, learning about positive mind. I think so. I never knew it i had to research and read about it mm. so um teaching yourself about um positive mind uh, gratitude and kindness and when you have all this around you then you attract mm. automatically yes, you attract the good that's things it. in your life that's i it. think so that's it isn't it you send the good stuff out to the universe yes. and you get it back. and you and get the good stuff, stuff back but you have to believe in it as yes, well you know i think so it. it's again it's a mindset work as you mentioned, work. Someone told me the hardest time of my life, they said, whatever you put out there is what you're going to get back. And I can, and that's great. That's easy to take mm. on board when you're in a good place, but it is equally applicable when you're in a bad place. Mm -hmm. So, Fran, I'm going to let you have the last closing thoughts. Mm. So, I was thinking about this, and I think um, there are a lot of women who would be hearing the show and who are probably feeling that they're not in the right relationship or they're going through a tough time. So I would, I would say, listen, start by, if you can't get out for whatever reason, you know, you want to stay because of the kids, you want, you don't, you're not financially stable, start by putting down boundaries. Start by saying to yourself every day, I'm worth it. I'm not going to take this, these bad words from him anymore. I'm going to go and, and spend some time on my own. I need that half an hour, if it's a bath or a walk, for your, your me, my me time, you know, do things for yourselves. Start to build up again who you were, where you, where you forgot yourselves, you know. Don't let, the, you know, you can, even if you're in a bad relationship, start by doing things for you, only for you. Spoil yourselves, you're worth it, you need it, you deserve it. So, and you can, you don't have to, I mean, obviously, it's difficult to just up and leave, you know, so especially if you have children, but there are strategies you can do. Go to therapy if you can afford it. There are some places where, like the YMCA, they have um, trainee therapists at 10 euros an hour, so you mm -hmm. can, um, to get the strength so that you can um, uh, feel better even in a bad relationship. Because when you take control, 
you know, obviously be careful if you're in a violent relationship because you have to be really careful because the more you try to take control, the more they will try to control you. But do those strategies of spoiling yourself a bit, you know, every day do something and keep repeating to yourselves, I'm worth it, I deserve better. That's my... And I will just say, you mentioned about getting help. We have mm -hmm. our partners at Richmond Foundation who do support women, even if you cannot mm -hmm. uh, afford it. The, okay, the number for that great. is 1770. And underneath here, we will also put the other numbers that you can reach out to other groups to get support as well. I want to say, ladies, this has been a phenomenal Thank show. Thank you. It was really good. I am good. It's so true. thrilled. Chin chin. Chin chin. I Cheers. can drink. Fine. Thank you so, <laughs> so yeah. much. Cheers. I'm going to reach right across. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Here's to the bright future. Cheers. 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 <laughs>